My name is Leslie Horton. I'm the director of Yavapai County Community Health Services. And I'm joined here today by Sally Slater, and she is our uh, nurse immunization supervisor and coordinating a lot of our vaccine um, efforts for Yavapai County. I'm also joined by Josh Goldman. He is our community um, public health emergency preparedness coordinator. And he's also worked with many of you on PPE distributions and other things. And so um, hopefully between the three of us, we can provide our expertise and knowledge at this point on vaccines and what we know of what's coming our way. And if you have questions, we'll try to answer them here. If we can't answer them here, we will um, take them back and then try to answer them later. But this presentation will be allowed, um, I'm sorry, will be posted to our website as well as probably our Facebook page after the fact. It might take a little while, but if you have people who wanted to watch and didn't get a chance to, they're more than welcome to catch them later. They just can't ask questions at the time. And we wanted to give you that opportunity to ask and get answers um, as we are here today. So thank you everybody for joining us. And David, could you go ahead and put the PowerPoint presentation up for me? All right, and as David mentioned, you are all muted uh, so that we don't have any background noise, uh, but please use that chat as you would like to, and hopefully we'll answer much of what your questions might be in the presentation. If we don't, uh, we'll work on getting those answered at the end. So first slide. So our vaccine is supposed to be arriving next week. As of today, Moderna, um, which is the second vaccine to seek emergency use authorization is going before the FDA, and they're supposed to and slated to be approved for emergency use authorization by the end of the week. So probably by today or tomorrow, we'll get news that Moderna vaccine has been approved. Pfizer already received its emergency use authorization last week, and um, they have started distribution of the Pfizer vaccine. Phoenix, Maricopa County, and Tucson uh, were the first in Arizona to start uh, receiving the vaccine. As of yesterday, I don't think they had received it yet, but I haven't heard as of whether they have received that yet today. We did decide as a state between all of the 15 counties uh, that the Pfizer vaccine, for reasons we'll explain later, uh, it's better off to be used in Maricopa County and Pima County because it's a little bit more difficult to manage and maintain and handle. Uh, the Moderna vaccine, if, from everything that we know so far, seems to be a little bit easier for storage and um, use in smaller, more rural areas. And so all of the 13 counties that are considered smaller and more rural will be receiving the Moderna vaccine as it's made available next week. So here's our time frame that we've set up for, it's very much an estimate at this point in time. Um, there's all kinds of things that are gonna play into this time frame, And, you know, I just ask that everyone be a little bit patient with us as we're gonna be trying to work on this gigantic project of getting all of our priority groups as well as our whole population vaccinated, at least those who want to be. And so currently, like I mentioned, the FDA is looking to provide an emergency use authorization for Moderna. Pfizer already has that. Vaccine um, is slated to arrive next week. Now there is a gigantic winter storm hitting the uh, Midwest and the East at this point in time. And so they have warned us that that could put a delay on some of the shipments going out. So we'll be kind of watching and waiting to find out how that looks. Uh, first priority in the vaccine distribution is given to healthcare practitioners and te technical occupations, as well as healthcare support occupations, emergency medical responders. And then there is a separate Walgreens CVS um, program, Walgreens and CVS program called the CDC Pharmacy Partner Program. And that was, um, that was opened up for long-term care facilities, assisted living and skilled nursing sites who uh, could sign up, that sign up is closed now. But hopefully many of our long-term care sites did sign up for that. 
Now, as we venture into January, our plan is to also start working on completing the phase one, which is those healthcare provider groups, um, long term care sites, but also venturing into the other phase one and phase two groups. And so um, on that second slide, if we get to it again, um, we will be venturing more into getting actual direct assisted living, independent living, HUD housing, DES group homes, especially for those with um, developmental disabilities and their staff, adults with high risk medical conditions in shelters or congregate living, law enforcement, corrections, national security, and then that's where we fit in also those teachers um, and child care workers. So we've got education, all of their support staff, as well as child care in that phase um, two, well, it's kind of phase one B. And uh, in looking at being able to, um, to utilize um, our shipments to get to those populations. Um, David, I can see that you don't have my most updated slides. So um, hopefully this one will be good enough. Then starting into the spring months, so February through March, we're going to be working towards getting into the more um, wide ranging essential worker groups. And so we are asking people to be very patient because this is gonna be a process that's gonna be based on supply. Uh, we're gonna, we know that there's gonna be a demand for a long time, but we're not quite sure how quickly the supply will uh, meet that demand. And so let me go ahead and we'll go ahead and advance to that next slide. All right, so the plan, like I mentioned earlier, is to start receiving Pfizer um, allocations to Maricopa and Pima counties Arizona is slated to get 212,550 doses of Pfizer and Moderna will start hopefully coming within next week. And that is going to be 171,200 doses to allocated to uh, rural, more rural Arizona. They consider us one of the more rural counties. And then there are going to be direct shipments. So the VA is going to get a direct federal allocation of the vaccine. And I heard from them yesterday that they are expecting their vaccine and will be able to vaccinate their own patients. And then we've got the pharmacies that have had the ability to sign up as pharmacy partners with CDC. Some of those will receive a direct allocation. And then our tribes will also be receiving direct allocations of vaccine. So the state has laid out a plan. You can go to their website, AZDHS, and it goes through the plan that they have so far. And it is currently based off of Pfizer vaccine with now the addition of Moderna. We do know that other vaccines will be approved uh, probably in the coming weeks and months. And so far, the only two that we're basing our plans off of are Pfizer and Moderna, knowing that they have the most supply available and the quickest emergency use authorizations um, planned. So, like I mentioned, those 15 county health departments are gonna all be getting their allocations around the same time as us. The tribes will also get theirs. Uh, they may have started already if they're receiving Pfizer, but for the most part, I think they're also expecting Moderna vaccine. And there's going to be other partnerships in place that will help us to vaccinate some of the harder to reach populations, such as long-term care, assisted living. Um, there is some, you know, we wanna make sure that we're, make, we're protecting those populations as much as possible while also vaccinating them. And so there is um, risk with any um, interaction there of going into assisted living and skilled nursing facilities. And we're trying to make sure that um, those sites are well equipped and ready for vaccination process, but also that those going in are also well equipped to make sure that they're protecting um, everyone as they go in. So we will be working towards um, vaccinating these priority populations just as quickly as possible. And 
yet making sure that we have the ability to um, do it carefully and um, and also not missing any of our populations. So David, go ahead and go to that next one. So the Moderna vaccine that we are supposed to receive is going today to get their emergency use authorization. They have shown to have an efficacy rate of 94.1% in a trial of 30,000 people. Um, the side effects that are generally temporary are fever, headache, and fatigue. And they're unpleasant, but not dangerous. Um, the, there has been in very, very, um, in very limited circumstances, I think three people so far that have received the Pfizer vaccine have had some allergic reactions. So we'll talk about that and why um, it may be important not to vaccinate people that have a lot of allergies uh, so far. So Pfizer is, um, it's these are mRNA vaccines and Pfizer does require ultra low cold storage at negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. And so Phoenix and Tucson both have massive ultra low cold storage facilities that they've acquired um, to store this vaccine. Once it's out of that ultra low cold, it can stay on dry ice five to 10 days, but the dry ice has to re be replenished every five days and you have to use it uh, very quickly thereafter. And so Pfizer is a little more difficult to handle. That is why we're slated to receive Moderna vaccine. And Moderna does not require the ultra low cold beyond the point where it can be refrigerated for 30 days. And so that allows us in our more rural areas to be able to distribute it and handle it and um, store it easier for short durations of time. Moderna is shipped in 100 pack boxes or 100 dose boxes as well, whereas Pfizer only comes in 975 dose um, pizza boxes, they're calling them, or large containers. So the advantage of Moderna is not requiring that ultra cold, but we can also transport it out to all areas of our county and communities a little bit easier than that Pfizer. Um, like I said, it can be refrigerated up to 30 days. Neither vaccine should be given to people with severe allergies at this point in time. Uh, when the emergency use authorization is approved for Moderna, we will have all of a sudden um, a whole bunch more information about it that'll be released. And I definitely recommend to all of you that you review that information thoroughly uh, if you plan on utilizing the vaccine. And that should be coming out by the end of the week, if not early next week. And so pregnant women can take these vaccines. It can cause a fever and other light side effects, but they don't think that the mRNA vaccines cross over into um, a fetus or a baby. And so they are recommending it for pregnant women as well. But um, that information will also be included in the information that's released. That is based off Pfizer for now that we have. And then our immunocompromised individuals can be vaccinated. That is the one group that is a little bit questionable as to how they will react to this vaccine. And they may actually have a shorter duration of immunity even after receiving the vaccine. And so that is um, kind of that unknown with immunocompromised folks, especially those with HIV and other um, immunocompromising uh, issues is that there's, there's some question there as to how long they will remain immune to uh, coronavirus. So go ahead and next slide. Maricopa County has put out a draft. This is a draft of a policy around the vaccine that kind of better explains what you're gonna be expecting when you receive the vaccine. So one of the things I'm recommending to uh, you as healthcare providers or long-term care is to stagger the vaccine possibly within your staff, maybe one week apart or um, or even days apart, but for the most part, these vaccines have been proven to be safe and very effective, 94.1%. Um, but there are some side effects that are temporary upon getting the vaccine. And so those most common side effects are fever, fatigue, headache, chills, myalgia, and arthralgia. And 
you know, these side effects are, like I said, short in duration. And so what this outlines for us is what to look for in your staff and how to consider whether those side effects could actually be a current COVID infection or are just side effects from the vaccine. So what they've decided based on what we know of these vaccines is that individuals that are vaccinated, if they, it's common to develop these side effects shortly thereafter. So if you're vaccinating your entire workforce, you got to realize there's going to be some people that come down with a fever, some that just feel really crummy that next day. Um, but the, va the vaccine should not cause side effects that last longer than 24 to 48 hours. And so that's kind of what they're outlining here. If you have individuals who come down with COVID-like symptoms um, after receiving the vaccine and it lasts longer than two days, they should be excluded from work um, because just because someone is receiving the vaccine today doesn't mean that they didn't have exposure within the last few days of COVID itself. And so we want to make sure that, you know, you're still aware that as we receive this vaccine, it is a two dose vaccine. The side effects tend to be less with the first dose and more with the second dose. But uh, make sure that you've got an awareness of your staff and if their symptoms remain or your long-term care folks, um, if their symptoms remain after two days, they should probably be tested for COVID-19 and so and excluded from work. There's also um, the fever measurement of 100.4 100 degrees Fahrenheit uh, should be excluded from work if it persists longer than two days. So that's the good news is that these symptoms don't last long, but be aware that just because someone got the vaccine today doesn't mean that they didn't have exposure to COVID-19 and we still need to react accordingly with quarantine and um, isolation periods and everything else until that second dose is given and even a, a little while after that. That will be included and Sally might be able to talk about that in terms of when this immunity is actually um, fully in, in capacity. And now generally with most vaccines, if it's two doses, your first dose is gonna give you the majority of your um, immuno, immunity. And then that second dose closes in the gap there to bring you up to that uh, 95 or 100% uh, uh, immunity. And so the first dose still leaves you a little bit vulnerable to COVID. And then after that second one, once that one is settled in and your immune system is bolstered against COVID, um, you should have at least a 94.1% immunity level. So go ahead, David, with the next one. I think we're gonna jump over to Josh, who is gonna discuss some of the onboarding and other parameters that we're looking at for um, this process. All right, thank you, Leslie. Um, so yeah, first big thing here, if you expect to receive vaccine and vaccinate and so on, the first thing that has to happen is you have to be onboarded through the ADHS system. Uh, we'll have a link and a flyer for that towards the end of the presentation, but that is the ultimate first thing that has to happen. Um, after that, you have to make sure that you're completely onboarded. It is a process. Uh, we do have a list of agencies in the county that are onboarded or in the process, and then a shorter list of those that are active, meaning you've completed. Um, until you have completely cle completed the onboarding process and we see you as active, we cannot allocate any doses to you. Uh, again, very few orders for allocation, so please order. We'll get more details with that also as far as ordering, um, but our initial allocation is very small. But the good news is pending EUA uh, for Moderna today, uh, we are expecting most likely weekly allocations to continue to roll in. So ideally, we will be able to um, roll right along and provide allocations to everyone once you order. Uh, the good news is everyone gets goodie bags when you do order the vaccine. Um, all vaccines do come with ancillary kits, so that will contain uh, syringes, patient fact sheets, a little bit of PPE. Um, if it is the Pfizer that requires ultra low storage, you'll also get cold handling gloves with that as well um, and dry ice. Um, with the Moderna, as Leslie touched on, um, all very happy for the most part, I imagine, to hear that we are getting the Moderna. Um, so again, Sally can talk more to this, but it's 
it's your standard frozen vaccine. No ultra low, no large pizza boxes with large orders, no ultra low storage required. Um, it can be stored in your standard vaccine fridge and freezers. Uh, again, the CDC uh, pharmacy program does begin the 27th. We do have a list of, I believe it is, yes, 87 facilities within the county that have registered for that. Unfortunately, if you have not registered your facility, uh, the registration, the open registration did close. Um, hopefully that will be reopening again to get anyone that was missed. But in the meantime, we will also be planning um, with our partners to um, get in and vaccinate those facilities that are not on the pharmacy program. Uh, next slide, please. Leslie, do you want me to address the priority groups as well? Yeah, I think that'd be great if you can. Okay, so we do. I see a few questions regarding um, phase one in the chat box, and we'll get to those um, when we get to the questions and answers at the end of the presentation. Um, but so phase one, phase one is broken down into three phases beginning uh, ideally this week when we receive the vaccine, December 2020, um, and going through spring of 2020, 2021. A uh, key thing to keep in mind that we are still pending the EUA for Moderna vaccine today. So uh, FDA will meet today, and if it is approved through the EUA, then ASIP will meet this weekend, this Saturday, Sunday, and give down hand down their guidance um, for the Moderna vaccine for phase one. But potential uh, phases we are looking at for phase one, again, it's going to be 1A, 1B, and 1C. 1A is going to be healthcare workers, emergency medical service workers, long term care facility staff, and residents. Uh, the pharmacy program we talked about will be working directly with skilled nursing facilities um, and not other long term care facilities at this time. Um, then moving into 1B, it will be healthcare workers not included in 1A, adults in congregate settings, so we can include shelters and things of that nature in 1B. Uh, law enforcement, teachers and child care workers, and then essential services and critical industry workers. Uh, and then finally, 1C, uh, again, looking maybe possibly in January, is going to be adults 65 and older, and then adults of any age with high risk medical conditions, comorbidities, and underlying conditions. Um, after that, we'll move into phase two, phase three, with uh, general population, additional high risk and critical populations. Um, and anyone missed in phase one or phase two. Hey, Josh. Uh, Sally. Sorry to interrupt. Our ancillary kits just got here, so I'm going to pop off for just a few minutes and then I'll be back because I can answer most of the questions in the chat. Excellent. Thank you, Sally. Right, so good news. We got those goodie bags. So um, when we, that's a good sign that we'll be receiving the vaccine on time this coming uh, 21st through the 23rd and get it out to those partners that have ordered initially. Um, so vaccine must be administered at no cost to the patient. Uh, Governor Doug Ducey put an executive order on that. Earlier on, there was talk of administrative fees to the organization and possibly to the patient. Uh, it has been handed down again that vaccine will be administered at zero cost to the patient. Um, CDC uh, Be Safe follow-up program is optional. Um, they have a V-Safe um, patient information that we are required to promote. To patients, uh, vaccinators are required to promote, and you can find more information um, on our website when we post it, but it is on ADHS and CDC's website as well. Uh, not required for the patient, but it is required, again, for vaccinators to promote it. Uh, providers administering the vaccine must enter every vaccine administered in the EMR system. Sally can touch more on that. Um, again, so once we get into um, phase one, two priority groups, a little more in phases, one, A, one B and one C, um, County Public Health will be looking um, for ourselves and to partner with other agencies in the county um, to operate pods, point of dispensing to reach uh, those priority groups. Um, vaccine side effects will be launching on the ADS website. Um, it's been noted that occasionally with people that have received the vaccine already, there can be harsh side effects, but they don't see it to be um, largely widespread. Uh, keep that in mind also because they are recommending when you are vaccinating this, especially this phase 1A and phase 1B groups and your frontline healthcare individuals, um, try to tier that if possible so you don't have um, a large majority of healthcare staff um, B 
being down with uh, COVID symptoms um, and side effects from the vaccine. Uh, and CDC Vaccine Finder will be launched eventually to direct public to vaccine providers. Next slide, please. So volunteer recruitment. Uh, this is a big one. Um, I don't know if you've seen in your agencies, we received a lot of interest in public health. Currently for Yalpai County, um, we are without, unfortunately, a Medical Reserve Corps coordinator that handles our volunteer management. Um, but the good news is the state's called ESAR VIP. It's Emergency System for Advanced Registration of Volunteer Health Professionals. Say that three times fast. Um, so that it, we are utilizing that as our volunteer management system um, until we are able to get an MRC coordinator up and onboarded. But the good news with this is that we won't leave any volunteers um, lying in the wind. So if we are unable to utilize um, local Yalpai County volunteers, but say Maricopa, Coconino, or other counties are, they are in a great statewide volunteer pool to be um, pulled where they're needed. And the same can be said the other way. If you have Coconino uh, volunteers that aren't being utilized, we can pull them for Yavapai. So if you do, if you are interested or do have anyone interested in volunteering, uh, please push them to the website um, on ADHS. It's gonna be azhealth.gov slash volunteer. You see that on your screen. Next slide, please. And then David, if you don't mind sharing that slide for um, onboarding. If you have not done so already, again, as I mentioned before, with the onboarding, if you wish to receive vaccine and vaccinate, um, onboarding is the first and crucial step. Uh, so Dave will be showing that flyer with the link here momentarily. One thing I was gonna add also is that our initial shipment next week is slated to be around 3,000 to 3,100 doses of vaccine. Um, we are allocated for 8,100 in the month of December, and so we will receive the remainder of that and any more that's allowed to us um, by the end of the month. And so one of the things that we are realizing with the, um, oh, you're going to go over the onboarding, Josh, and putting in orders. I was hoping Sally could go um, when she gets back a little more on the putting in orders. I know that is a work in progress. Um, she has more knowledge on that, but basically where we are at is uh, the ADHS uh, vaccine management tool provided some, some issues for us in the county along with other counties, you could say. So we are pending approval from ADHS to utilize a vaccine management tool we already have. Um, and then in the meantime, I believe we are going to be taking orders via email, but I will let Sally speak to that in more detail when she returns. Okay, excellent. We definitely need people's orders so that we know how much vaccine you all want to receive. And David, thank you for putting that on. So this is the B vaccine ready. A lot of providers hopefully have already seen this um, via ADHS communications, but David, if you could scroll down, um, the big part of this at the bottom is that link, uh, the redcap.link slash onboard. That'll get you to where you need to be to begin the process for onboarding so you can receive and then vaccinate. I'm not sure how long it'll take Sally to come back from what she's working on. Um, maybe we should go ahead and start. If there's some questions in the chat that we want to go, oh, there she is. All right. So Sally, one of the things that we wanted you to maybe discuss with everyone is that onboarding process. Um, I do know as of now, there are 27 onboarded providers, but only two have put in orders. And those are our two hospitals. So thank you, hospitals, for putting in your orders. But we most definitely need to hear from others. So I was going to let you discuss um, both the onboarding and the ordering, but also maybe to the requirement of the data entry uh, with the vaccine. Oh, yeah, that's that's a lot. So the onboarding process is pretty it's pretty heavy. They have a lot of questions. You have to send pictures of your storage units and it has to be approved by ADHS. 
Um, there are several that have began the onboarding process. Sorry, I'm short-winded. I just loaded 20 boxes into the front office. Um, <clears throat> so there, there's about 19, 18 that have not completed the onboarding process. I have 25 who have completed the onboarding process. All other facilities haven't even started it. Um, I don't know if Josh shared the slide yet or the flyer with the onboarding process, um, the link to the red cap. So that's yeah, where that has to go through. Okay, perfect. Um, once you are approved by ADHS and you're showing active in our onboarding list, you can then request doses for your facility. And that is if you are going to be a vaccine provider, which means you're going to be vaccinating your own staff, or your own residents, or holding clinics to vaccinate our priority groups along with us. Um, at this point, those orders are not being put through ACES, which is a state uh, vaccine registry. They are going directly to myself and Josh. I have only seen requests for doses from VVMC and YRMC at this point. I did see something in the chat from uh, Prescott Rehab that they had requested doses. I haven't seen that come through yet. Um, what else did you want me to answer, Lucy? Is there anything else that they need to know about the data entry um, upon receiving vaccine and as it's being administered? So you need to make sure that when you are documenting the doses administered, that all of the required information is transmitted from your current EHR or EMR to the ACES registry. If it is not, you do need to get on board with um, us in the state to use the vaccine management system that's being provided that will talk to the state registry so that these doses can all be accounted for. And every EUA comes with a list of the required demographic information that needs to be reported along with the vaccine administration. One thing that I didn't mention earlier is that as new vaccines are approved and given emergency use authorization, if somebody receives a first dose of Moderna, they have to receive a second dose of Moderna. You can't intermix any of these brands, even if we start receiving shipments of Pfizer or others, we need to make sure that it's the same dose both times or it's considered starting someone over with a second dose if you um, if you give them a different brand of vaccine. So um, make sure that as things get a little more complicated and more options are there for vaccine that you're maintaining each patient having the same uh, brand of both doses. And every ancillary kit that we receive has a vaccine record card that shows what vaccine you received. So it'll say either Moderna or Pfizer on it, and it'll have a date of when your second dose is due. So that's going to help us better track who needs which vaccine, as well as the state registry will show if they receive Moderna or Pfizer. So we know what that second dose needs to be as well. All right, I think we're ready for questions. Uh, Terry or David or anyone else over there, can you help us to read some of those questions? I got this, Leslie. Um, Vonda is first up. So you are requesting vaccine for Northland Cares. Um, that is, you can actually email me that question because we have to figure out how we're going to go about that if you, because normally we vaccinate all of your patients. So that would be more of us setting up a day and time to come vaccinate your patients at the clinic. As far as printed information, I saw you ask later down the line. Um, there is no data at this point showing whether or not it is safe or effective in the HIV population. With that being said, they can still get vaccinated, but they need to know that there are no studies done yet. And there is no printed information at this time. And that was that one I touched on earlier is that those that are immunocompromised, they go ahead and recommend the vaccination, but they're not sure, um, especially with Pfizer, how long it will actually build immunity for. So there may be a closer succession and revaccination, but we still don't have any information on that as to how long the vaccine is going to last in any population because it's only been tested now for uh, several months, but we will 
hopefully know more as time progresses. All right, next question, Sarah Downs. Um, will a skilled nursing facility be able to receive the vaccine if you are currently experiencing experiencing an outbreak? You're willing to administer it in-house if allowed. So for long-term care facility residents, if there is a known exposure, yes, we can still vaccinate them. If they are known to have current infection, it is recommended that vaccine for that patient is deferred until they recover from acute illness. Non-medical caregivers, will they be on phase one? Well, you're still a healthcare provider. I mean, you're still going into these homes of patients and potentially being exposed. So I would imagine that yes, our home health care providers are still going to be part of phase one, given that we have enough doses. Home health is actually phase one B. And so it's not the really early, early health care provider or long term care or assisted living, but it's just right thereafter. So anyone providing home health, it's phase one B. Okay, and I believe that answers the next question as well from Esther. Uh, Anna, does healthcare workers include healthcare staff for licensed residential addiction treatment and licensed detox facilities? Leslie, do you have that on your list? I'm looking for that one. Where, so which I, was the question? I can speak that speak to that a little bit, Leslie, if you'd like. Um, so again, all of these are potential. Nothing is really in stone until ACIP meets this weekend, pending the Moderna EUA, but adults in congregate settings. Um, so that would include behavioral health, um, residential facilities, such as yours with detox facilities would be uh, included in 1B if that carries through. Yeah, and the actual two recovery centers and some of those are if there are adults that are not considered high risk and being 65 or older, and having um, underlying health conditions, uh, places like recovery centers, even um, incarcerated folks and others are in 1C is my understanding and that they are, um, they're in the priority list, but a little bit after some of these initial priorities of the um, people with advanced age and underlying health conditions in congregate settings. Oh, yeah. Let me scroll back here. Josh White, how do we apply for vaccines? Can we get staff and residents vaccinated? How does it work if we don't have a sub zero freezer? Can a certain number be set aside and then we go to a site to be vaccinated? Josh, if you are not onboarded to vaccinate your own staff, um, then yes, you could work with us or our partners once that is set up to vaccinate your staff to go to a site, whether it be us or a hospital pod, to have your staff vaccinated as healthcare providers. We are working on adding a link onto our website right now so that people can email us their uh, name of their facility, a contact person, and an estimate on how many staff and or residents they want vaccinated. And so we're working on getting that up on our website um, so that you can let us know if you need, um, you know, if you need us to come out and vaccinate. Hopefully many of you did sign up for that Walgreens program, but I know that there's a number that did not. Okay, this is a question probably for Leslie and Josh. Would our Taros Health Mobile Crisis Teams be considered in the January priority group as in field crisis intervention in response or in a later group? I would consider that not direct health care, but emergency response. And so that would be somewhere there. And in, in there's a lot of gray areas in these priority groups, but I would say a group like that definitely would be fitting into like at least, if not the 1A, the 1B group. So it's gonna be here in the earlier priorities. Okay, Vonda again, um, again, no, there's not printed information for HIV patients, but yes, absolutely. As we get that information, um, we'll definitely give it to you. And yes, Christine will probably be the one to bring that vaccine and vaccinate your, your, uh, your folks over there. Um, Sunshine, should I first order? Should 
Should my first order only be enough vaccine to cover our staff or also other health care providers? Sunshine, are you from Spectrum? Is this, am I on the same one? Okay. So, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. I think at this point, make sure you, you request enough to vaccinate your own staff, all of your own health care providers. And then that can be a later discussion. Again, with the weekly allocations, might be a little bit easier if you're going to set up a pod site um, to vaccinate other health care providers that are not your own staff. One thing I wanted to clarify also is that as you health care providers put in your orders, this initial um, orders are only for your staff, not patients yet. So in keeping with the priority groups, um, make sure that if you are getting this vaccine early, that we're not going outside of kind of where we're at in line with um, those priority groups. And so if you need to check in with us, please do and find out kind of where we're at at the time. But this initial group is only the healthcare providers and support staff, and it's not going out to your patients. So we need to make sure that in keeping fairness and an even playing field here that we try to make sure we're sticking with the priority groups first. Um, also, one of the questions is with a place like um, Mingus Mountain Academy and others, the initial priority on these can be given. We can, we can vaccinate a healthcare provider within a site. So if you have a healthcare like a nurse or on staff health aide or anyone else, we can vaccinate them first. And then as the rest of the site becomes a priority group in 1B or 1C, we can vaccinate the rest of uh, the staff. So it's kind of interesting in that we can fit in people that are considered healthcare first, and then the rest of the staff and employees might be able to come just shortly thereafter in getting their vaccine. There's also the option for our healthcare providers to wait till the whole group is a priority, but we're going to try to work ways in to get those healthcare people that are putting and having more exposure to those that are sick um, to get vaccinated first. Okay, Mara, what's the smallest amount of vaccine you can order? Can you order just enough to vaccinate people in a small medical office? Uh, minimum order for Moderna for us to direct ship to your facility if you are active and onboarded is 100 doses. Um, so if you have a very small staff, it's better to partner with us or another agency for them to vaccinate your staff. And Vonda, no, you do not need to do the onboarding process, Vonda, because you will not be administering the vaccines to your own clients or your own staff. We'll do that for you. Michelle, is it recommended that patients that have already had COVID get vaccinated? Yes, it is, um, because we don't know how long that immunity lasts after active infection. How do you find out if your clinic has been registered? Oh, Jeanette, um, I do not have any active next cares. So your facilities have not been onboarded and I also don't see um, them in the pending list. So I don't believe next care has started the onboarding process at all. Sunshine, are we triaging priority populations for each phase? Is verbal confirmation enough or is there a need to verify in some way? That's a very good question. We, you know, that's a, it, that question comes up a lot and we know that there's probably going to be people that try to squeeze into earlier priority groups. Um, you know, in certain groups, you can ask for proof and in certain groups, you just can't. And, you know, asking someone if they're a priority for underlying health conditions or other things is, is not probably a good course of action, but, you know, we're hoping people will work with us and, and be honest about whether or not they fit into these groups. And then you're going to have a few that squeak in that maybe didn't, but um, hopefully that'll be the minority, not the majority. And um, one of the questions Sharon had in there is if an employee is leaving prior to their time for their second dose, should they get the vaccine? And I would say not if you cannot um, confirm that you're going to be able to give them the second dose. And so I, if, you know, we need people to try to stick with the same health care provider um, that gave them the first dose and go back for the second one. And so if, 
if that's the case, and hopefully the rarity, you know, I would recommend against and sending them elsewhere or asking them to wait until they are in a new location and can get the vaccine. Okay, Mark Lopez, as ER physicians at YRMC, where can we expect to get the vaccine administered? I assume YRMC will be getting vaccine shipments. Is there some kind of sign up process? Um, uh, Dr. Ekman is handling the YRMC vaccine process, and yes, they have already requested doses for their own staff. And Dr. Ekman, there you go. In the ancillary kids, are there paper consent forms for the recipient of the vaccines or do you have them available electronically? Uh, would you guys like me to go grab an ancillary kit and check it out? Leslie? Sure, that would be fine. I can try to work on some of these other questions. All right, let me grab one. And so the timing for the second dose on Moderna is 28 days later. That is Matt's question. And um, and so this one can be 28 days at a minimum, it sounds like, but we may find out different information. It, I've heard varying information from what we know now. Pfizer is 21 days apart, it sounds like, and then Moderna is 28 days apart, but it can be uh, longer than that. It just can't be a shorter duration of time in between first and second dose. So, we will be sharing, somebody asked if we're gonna share this PowerPoint and um, presentation. We are gonna have them available on our website after the fact. So it might take us a minute to download it and get everything linked in there today, but we will be posting these for others that missed the presentation or want more information after the fact. Um, they just, we had tried to get as many people on here in the live version as possible to be able to ask questions. And so we did post our hotline to which if people have questions afterwards, we do have our hotline that's available for phone calls. That is the 442-5103 number. And that is um, a place people can call with questions later and they can always um, contact us. Many of you are in contact with us already through um, this process. So let me see here if there's other questions. Lorena Padilla put her email on here if you want to also just get the PowerPoint itself. Um, I'll make sure that it's the most recent version. I know that there was a couple things I corrected, um, but this one is just fine too. It was very minor changes. And let's see here. Somebody asked, Deborah asked, how strict is receiving the second dose in seven days? Um, can it be given on the sixth day or the eighth day or the ninth day? It's actually 28 days apart. And then it can be, I, I've heard a recommendation that you make sure it's within 60 days, um, no longer than that. But um, I'm hoping I'm answering that question correctly. But first dose is day one on day 28. You can give the second dose and Hopefully, they're in the, a short duration thereafter, but there is some flexibility there for the second dose. And in addition to your answer, Leslie, with the 28 day time frame, we do have a four day grace period. So if it is given four days early, that dose is still considered valid. Um, they are still wanting you to try to get it within 30 days. But if we miss that 28 or longer day, you know, cutoff, it is not recommended that we revaccinate. We just pick up where we left off, similar to every other vaccine series that we do. Um, Dr. Ekman, there is no um, consent form for the recipient. We'll be making our own forms here in the office. And I imagine that is what all facilities should be doing as well. Leslie, where did you leave off on the questions? I, Sharon has this question about if an employee has had COVID in the last 90 days, but is recovered, can they receive the vaccine? Yes, they can. 
Um, some people may opt to wait until, you know, they're, they're showing from what we know now, there is some antibody resistance that builds up naturally after you've had COVID for a varying time period. And so we've seen people have lessened antibody resistance after four to five to six months. But yes, people can, if they've had the, the actual virus and recovered, they can get the vaccine at any point thereafter. Okay, Dr. Ekman about the allergies. Correct, it is a contraindication to give the vaccine to anybody who has an anaphylactic reaction um, to any of the vaccine ingredients. Um, folks with a history of severe allergies, so if they have a history of anaphylactic reactions to any injectable medications um, or most medications, it's a precaution. It's not at this point a contraindication. Um, Kevin, if we have leftover vaccine that we're unable to use for employees, if they change their mind, who can we offer it to? Basically, we don't want to waste any doses. So if we have more doses than we need, we move on to the next priority group. One thing I'd like to add here is we are looking for you as healthcare providers to partner with us to help vaccinate other groups. So especially if we have those smaller um, healthcare providers that don't have enough uh, staff to need 100 doses. We're looking to some of our other partners to help to vaccinate those or share vaccines. So that will help if we kind of have an idea of who can't vaccinate their own or has a smaller group, we can go ahead and link you up maybe with other providers and um, schedule to go ahead and bring in your staff um, with those others that can help vaccinate. And then we will be offering that up as well for groups to um, partner up with us and go ahead and give those vaccines to those early priority groups. Later in the game or in the vaccination process, we will be having larger vaccination pods for like essential workers and others. Um, and we'll be opening up by invite only, you know, groups. But for now, we wanna make sure we're getting this, the healthcare providers and long-term care sites um, accomplished first. Great. Chrissy, as a hospice, should we sign up and complete the onboarding process to be a provider to vaccinate our staff? Um, if you want to provide vaccines in the long run, I would recommend onboarding, absolutely. Um, as far as vaccinating your own staff, you need to be absolutely sure that you can store the vaccine appropriately and use the full 100 doses in the amount of time that, that you're given. So it can only be stored in your refrigerator for 30 days. Um, it can be stored in a freezer within a certain temperature range for longer, but fridges are 30 days. So yes, I would recommend you on board if at some point you want to vaccinate others. Um, Kevin, how does the vaccine affect breastfeeding in mothers and children? So we don't really know. Um, it is not a contraindication to vaccinate pregnant women or breastfeeding mothers, but there is not any information known about how that transfers through the breast milk to the child. Um, again, we it's not a live vaccine, so we don't feel that there should be any problems, but we have not, we don't have any safety data on that at this point. Holly, I'm over assisted living at Touchmark at the ranch. How can I be sure that we are signed up? I received a survey by Omnicare, but no further correspondence after that. Do I anticipate that they will reach out or what's the best way to follow up? Holly, you need to go to the red cap link to onboard as a provider. Um, I don't know what the Omnicare survey was. Anna, so if you can vaccinate our nurses first as priority, how do we go about registering if we did not do that through Walgreens? Yes, wait for the link on our website so that you can provide us information on your needs. We're working on that now and we'll try to have that up, um, that link up on our website here within the next couple of days, hopefully by Monday at the latest um, so that we can start receiving those orders from you or requests. Or and additionally, the allocation. Uh, additionally, if we do receive word notification that that uh, pharmacy program has reopened for registration, we'll be promoting that as well. 
Secretary, Laura, where in the prioritization will the staff and participants of medical adult daycare centers fall into, Leslie? That sounds like it would be there in 1A. And so at least the staff first, and then probably the um, clients later. So that would, there is gonna be some differentiation, but a place like that where it doesn't, it's not designated by the state plan, we can try to fit that in there with um, other medical and support. All right, Kevin, should we vaccinate employees who've tested positive in the last 90 days? I think we touched on that. Yes, as long as they have recovered um, from the acute illness. Sherry, after you're vaccinated, do you still need to wear an N95 when caring for a COVID positive patient? Yes. Still maintain all of the CDC recommend recommendations to avoid um, exposure and infection. Michelle, if our facility is registered to partner with CVS for a vaccine clinic, when can we anticipate being contacted by the pharmacy and do we have to pre-register those wanting a vaccine? I have no idea how the pharmacy process is working. Um, I believe that in our larger communities, um, like Mar well, like Maricopa and Pima County, I think they are getting some of their shipments this week potentially, but they should be reaching out to everybody who has signed up with them to set dates for your facility. I would reach out to your contact um, at CVS. Yeah, let me clarify there too. People that are calling the local Walgreens and CVS, that's not who you're looking for. You're looking for the CDC pharmacy partner program um, that you signed up with. And they have announced that they're gonna go ahead and start vaccination the week of December 27th, but they have not. I know that there are some sites that have received a call and confirmed a date and time already, and some have not. So they're gonna be working through probably a first come first serve whoever signed up and you should be receiving communication from that program. But don't call the local CVS or Walgreens with questions. They won't know how to answer. Right. Stacy, can you please provide the contact emails that we need to connect with to establish a partnership for securing and vaccinating our staff and long-term care clients? Do we just want to pop our email addresses in? Yeah, I think that would be good. What we're going to do is set up a, when the link is added to our website, it's going to alert us um, in a group to know, you know, who we're working with, who needs help, who needs to partner with other sites. And so we're going to try to have that up by Monday and if we, um, in the meanwhile, if you want to go ahead and um, who should we, which email should we use in the meantime? I've put my email in the chat box. You can reach out to me at josh.goldman at Yelpi US um, and we can get that to Sally so she can put it in the system. Uh, I just added mine in there. Please just copy me on it as well. Actually, it may not have gone through. I can't seem to send anything in the chat box. Uh, Vonda, okay for the slide. Sharon, is there a titer test and antibody test that will tell the person if their vaccine was successful? successful? Um, so, <sighs> yes, you can do antibody testing to see if you are showing antibodies. Um, but at this point, serology testing prior to or after the vaccine is not a recommendation. But either way with infection or with the vaccine, you'll see that on an antibody test. Mingus Mountain Academy, Michelle, let me check our active list. Yes, you guys are onboarded and active. So those of you that are onboarded and active, please put in your orders. And that way we know how many vaccines to accept. Also, it helps our processes because we'll be going in and allocating um, our supplies as they're made available to us, to you all. Um, in this initial shipment, we will likely be getting them all within at the health department, but then in future shipments, as you allocate doses, they should come as a direct shipment to you. 
as long as you've onboarded and have the refrigeration and everything you need, um, it will be your responsibility to take those allocations and utilize them. So make sure that you're getting your allocations in. And at this point in time, they'll make sure that your orders only include your staff and those that support your operations, not necessarily your patients at this point in time. Those will come down the road as we get into phase 1C, probably closer to um, end of January and February. The so last chance here to put any questions in the chat. I want to thank you all very, very much for attending. Hopefully this gave you some additional information that you didn't have before. Like I recommended earlier, please keep an eye out for the Moderna information that comes out as the emergency use authorization is likely to be processed. Uh, we wanna make sure that you all are well informed on your end and can be able to um, also answer questions as your staff have them. We are available anytime you need us to also answer questions and help in these processes. So um, make sure you complete your onboarding process. Make sure that you find out within your staff how many want the vaccine. Um, so far at a statewide level, it has been um, stated that the vaccine is optional. It's not a requirement. Um, whether you decide to make it a requirement, I would definitely recommend to consult your legal um, experts on those kind of things. Uh, but I think that this hopefully will provide us um, a turning point where it will give the people who have a lot of exposure as well as those who need protection, uh, protection from this virus. And so I do look forward to months ahead where COVID isn't the only thing that we have to be so focused on. So uh, thank you all very much for attending. Um, always contact us with questions if you have them, and we will be posting this to the web page and possibly to Facebook as well uh, as soon as we can today. So I don't see, oh, wait, hold on. There might be one more question. Will the first dose and second dose be sent to the onboarded agency at the same time? I think that what we'll try to do is probably break up those shipments into two separate. Um, you can store them for 30 days in the refrigerator, but since they're given 28 days apart, it might be best to do it in two separate um, shipments. And so when we receive these, we should be receiving them nearly weekly, if not every two weeks, our supplies is what we've been told. So we should have a pretty regular supply coming. Just make sure that your orders, if you're onboarded, are um, in there in the system, and we'll try to make sure that we can supply these at a regular interval for you to get those first and second doses. And then if I could add a, an additional comment to that as well, um, if you, the onboarded provider, are ordering those vaccines, keep in mind that the second dose isn't automatic, that you will need to keep track of the 28 days and order that second dose uh, to be ready to administer. All right, well, thanks again, everybody. I appreciate your partnership in this and look forward to working with all of you in the coming weeks as we get this vaccine. Thank you very much.